Hi, everyone. My name is Shana Augustin. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at NIAAA in the Laboratory for Integrative Neuroscience under the supervision of Dr. David Lovinger. Today, I'm going to share some still developing work with everyone. And it's unpublished. We're actively and vigorously working on this line of research. It's part of my K99 grant that I was recently awarded. And I will tell you about some new cyclic MP sensors that we're testing and optimizing for in vivo application, as well as some work that we've started with the PK sensor. And of course, I would like to thank the organizers for from Lab Roots Neuroscience 2020 for inviting me to share my research. <laughs> we're, inter we're interested in the brain. Depicted here on the right is a basal ganglia circuit diagram, a simplified version of it. The basal ganglia are a group of subcortical nuclei that's involved in purposeful actions and are oftentimes affected in many neurological disorders. The striatum sits at the center of the basal ganglia. It receives inputs from various parts of cortex, including limbic and thalamic cortical motor systems. It also receives inputs from dopaminergic areas such as the substantia nigra. We're interested in the neural basis of decision making. We're particularly interested in how information flows through these circuits to affect behavior various behaviors such as action initiation, action control, and action learning. But we're not only interested in what happens on a circuit level, we're interested in what happens on a synaptic level. We know that cellular changes can lead to changes in excitability, as well as short-term and long-term transmission, which can ultimately affect circuit function, thereby affecting behavior. We know that there's two types of neuronal communication. Both are activated by ligand binding. Ionotrophic receptors are fast acting in which the ligand binds, thereby causing activation, opening or closing of a channel. Or metabotrophic receptors are slower acting because these receptors signal through second messengers. Metabotrophic receptors have been implicated in, in virtually all functions, cellular functions, and are often the target of many um, neurological diseases and are often affected as well. What we're interested in is how is it that GPCRs signal through limited downstream signaling pathway? How is information maintained and encoded so that the cells are guided to its appropriate response, despite having a limited number of G protein, as well as downstream signaling pathways. We're interested in how these second messengers ch change in the temporal resolution, as well as the spatial resolution, and how this differ during different parts of behavior during the acquisition phase versus the learning phase. We're also interested in how these subcellular molecules interact with each other. For example, neuromodulators such as dopamine and calcium, as well as other sensors such as like again, P and dopamine and calcium. So we're really interested in looking at these subcellular changes in vivo while the animals are actively learning a task. We're currently testing two cyclic MP sensors and we're optimizing them for in vivo application. Once one sensor depicted on the left is a single wavelength fluorescent sensor and on the right is a fret based sensor. They both share very similar domain structure. With the intensity-based sensor, CADIS, when cyclic AMP binds to the regulatory domain, we have a conformational change in which the catalytic and the regulatory region comes closer together, causing 
the GFP protein to fluoresce. The FRET-based sensor, which is, they're both derived from EPAC-2. The EPAC sensor, the FRET-based sensor, has the similar design. However, we're using fluorescent lifetime to quantify FRET activity. FRET is a phenomenon in which you have a transfer of energy from donor to acceptor. In this case, in the absence of cyclic AMP, the donor flow four is actually very close to the acceptor flow four. So you have instances of FRET. This results in a shorter lifetime. The donor in our sensor is mTOR voice. In the presence of cyclic AMP, once cyclic AMP binds to the regulatory region, the donor flow four, which is m turquoise, moves further away from our venous flow fours, and this results in a longer donor lifetime. First, we'll talk about some experiments that I have started using the intensity base sensor. We're interested in looking at changes in live brain slice as well as in vivo. And in order to look at changes in live brain slice with our intensity-based sensor, we're using brain slice photometry. This uses a photon multiplier-based photometry system. Depicted on the right, the lower right of my schematic is a coronal striatal section. We can take or we can zoom in to a small region of interest and in many cases it's 180 by 180 microns. We then shine blue light onto the surface of our slice to activate GFP. Light is emitted from our sample. It's filtered through appropriate filters and the voltage output from our PMT is then fed into our computer. Seen on the left is actually our experimental output. The shutter opens on the bottom. The shutter opens, we have blue light. The F value is actually our baseline value or our background fluorescence. We can electrically stimulate a response as seen here. In this case, it's actually cyclic AMP, and we can have a evoke fluorescence increase, which is our delta F. We can compare things such as our delta F over F, so peak changes versus over our baseline, and we can also look at changes in our background fluorescence. The shutter stays open for some time, and then it closes again. <laughs> Depicted here on the left is a schematic in which we've actually expressed our CADIS, which is our cyclic AMP intensity-based sensor, into a particular subset of neurons. In this case, it's a D1 Cre that we're using to express our CADIS sensor in D1 medium spiny neurons in the striatum. We know that these medium spiny neurons contain dopamine D1 receptors, and these receptors upon activation are positively coupled to cyclic AMP. At the top, the first response we see is we can electrically stimulate and we can evoke an increase in cyclic AMP as depicted here by an increase in fluorescence intensity. And if we thereby, and this is with 200 microsecond duration stimulation, if we then increase our stimulation duration to one millisecond, we can thereby further increase our cyclic AMP response as depicted here in red as an increase or an increase in fluorescence intensity. The next question that we were interested in asking is whether or not this response is actually synaptic or some technical error of our system or our setup. We actually washed on TTX at one micromolar and depicted here on the bottom. Here's a representative. We can evoke a nice response, which is our black and baseline. And in the presence of TTX, this response goes away. So it's diminished. This is indicating that our response is indeed synaptic. If we washed on onto our slice, 
10 micromolar foscomin, what we see is an increase in background fluorescence. So foscomin is an activator of cyclic AMP, and thereby this increases our background fluorescence, so it increases cyclic AMP. Next, we were wondering where is CADEX being expressed in this population of neuron? Seen here is a two photon image of a brain slice and baseline measurement. We can see very dimly what could be dendrites after washing on phosculin and IBMX. So phosculin is an activator of adenylene cyclase and IBMX is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. This is done to increase cyclic AMP. What we see is a change in fluorescence as depicted here in white. We can see now see nicely the dendrites of the cell and as well as the cell body. We're in the process of actually quantifying the rest of our data. <clears throat> but this is good indication because what is not seen in with our slice photometry method is actually where these where our sensor is expressed. And this is good a good test to us that is actually expressed in the dendrites as well as the cell body within our slice preparation. Next, we wanted to express the caddis sensor in the dorsolateral striatum, however, at this time in D2 MSNs. We did that by using an A2 acre. We know that D2 receptor D2 MSNs contain D2 receptors. These receptors are negatively coupled to cyclic MP. So activation of those receptors would decrease cyclic MP. What we see once we stimulate, we see a downward deflection. Even though it's very small, we're still able to resolve these changes. This speaks to the power of using our technique, which is the slice photometry technique using PMTs. If we did the same thing using our, as we did with the D1 MSN, if we increase the duration width of our stimulation, we can modulate that effect. So we can further decrease or see a further decrease in cyclic AMP. Again, asking the same question, whether or not this response is indeed real, is it synaptic or something else? We washed on one micromolar of TTX as depicted on the bottom. And what you see is that the response goes away. We're in the process of looking at how this signal is affected by phosphorin as well as high BMX. So this fits with what we know in the literature about D1 MSNs and D2 MSNs, and that activation of these um, receptors through dopamine might result in D1 MSNs leading to increases in cyclic AMP, being that they're positively coupled, and D2 MSNs leading to decreases in cyclic AMP because they're negatively coupled. <laughs> Next, we wanted to look at dopamine release while measuring um, cyclic AMP in our slices. And in order to do this, we synchronize our brain slice photometry system with fast scan cyclic voltammetry to the same stimulation. So in order to measure dopamine in this case, we're using a carbon fiber that has been inserted into a glass electrode. And what we're doing, we're ramping, we're raising and lowering the voltage very rapidly in the striatum at our region of interest. And this causes the oxidation and reduction of dopamine. This causes a small electrical um, current that we're able to measure. And we're able to measure monoamines such as dopamine because each uh, monoamine has a unique current voltage um, relationship. So this is really, really good. We really wanted to do this for a long time and we were able to do it. So we're simultaneously reporting changes in cyclic AMP and dopamine to the same stimulation. And this is what we see. So depicted on the top, 
we can just look at the representative traces. At first, at the top, we're looking at dopamine and at the bottom, we're looking at D1 MSN cyclic MP. So we're expressing cyclic MP or the caddis, we're expressing caddis in D1 MSNs. And what we see with dopamine with a single pulse, we see a nice in black, we see a nice dopamine response. We also see at the bottom in black, a nice cyclic MP response. I have to say that we did with and without DH beta E. DH beta E is a nicotinic, a nicotinic or a nicotine, sorry, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor antagonist. <laughs> and what we see once we wash on DH beta E with dopamine, we see a reduction in dopamine, and we also see a reduction in cyclic NP. This seems to be a one-to-one -one relationship, being that if there's less dopamine around, there's less dopamine to activate our D1 receptor, resulting in less cyclic MP. If we then apply six pulses at 50 hertz, this work has been shown by Stephanie Craig in 2004. What you see is actually an enhancement or a relief, or, or a relief from the DH beta E suppression with one pulse. So you actually get a bigger dopamine response in the presence of DH beta E with more um, <clears throat> phasic stimulation. However, with cyclic MP, what we see in the presence of DH beta E is actually less of an inhibition. So they seem to be that one-to-one -one relationship has now been interrupted and now we're stimulating at 50 Hertz there's other things being released, other neuromodulators being released in striatum, and that might contribute to why we see less of an inhibition. Depicted on the far right on top is just a bar graph with the percent change in dopamine in which we see with one P or one pulse stimulation, we actually see maybe a 70% decrease, whereas with the frequency stimulation at 50 hertz, we see a 20% increase. <laughs> With cyclic MP, D1 cyclic MP towards the bottom, please forgive me, the axis is wrong. It's not percent baseline dopamine, it's actually percent baseline cyclic MP. And what we see is a 90% reduction with one pulse and less of an inhibition or less of a reduction with DH beta E on board. Again, the axis, the Y axis is actually percent baseline of cyclic MP. It's not dopamine. <laughs> Next, we're interested in looking at EPAC, which is a fret-based sensor. The fret-based sensor offers many advantages, or unlike intensity-based sensor, these sensors are less sensitive to photo bleaching, also um, sensor concentration, light scattering deep down in deep brain structures. Therefore, we can use lifetime measurement to quantify fret activity and not have to deal with any of the troubleshooting or any of the problems that might plague more intensity-based sensor. We've tested our EPAC sensor in hex lysates as seen in the middle. As you increase the concentration of cyclic MP, you get longer lifetimes, which seems to fit. Also in hex cells, if we wash on phosphorin at 100 micromolar, we see a shift in lifetime measurement. So again, longer lifetime, which indicates more cyclic AMP. But like I started off this morning, or at the be not this morning, but at the beginning of my talk, I said we wanted to use this for in vivo applications. So in order to use EPAC, EPAC is a very large protein. Our EPAC protein is approximately 800 amino acid, not including the fluorophores. The fluorophores are approximately 230 amino acid each, and we have an mTOR coils and two venous molecules. And in order to actually package the EPAC structure into an AAV form, 
We had the help of a staff scientist in my co-mentors lab, which is Dr. Steve Vogel, but Dr. Henry Paul actually engineered this virus in which he used an entine structure that brings both halves of the structures together, both part of the virus, the C terminus and N terminus together via this entine region that splices out and it's a protein intron almost. And what we can do is that only when the two halves of the EPAC structure comes together do we actually see fluorescence. We have expressed this two-part virus in the dorsolateral striatum. As seen here, we can get nice fluorescence as seen in the middle. And if we actually take striatal tissue from brain, we can actually pull out the protein as indicated in the Western blot, and is of the same size as the intact N terminus and C terminus. So we do believe that our virus, our EPAC virus in brain is, is actually coming together correctly and is of the right size. However, we're still in the process of testing this in vivo in awake behaving animals. But what we have been able to test so far is TACAR alpha. It's a PK sensor that's developed by Tiani Mouse, Dr. Tiani Mouse group from Oregon. And in order to do this, we're using time correlated single photon counting fiber photometry in vivo. This allows us to use a multi mode fiber for excitation as well as photon emission. And this allows us to do more chronic long-term experiments. Using this system, we can get both changes in intensity, so peak changes in intensity, as well as lifetime measurement. So using this one system, we can look at um, sensors such as CADIS, which is more intensity-based, but we can also look at EPAC and this newly optimized sensor, which is lifetime-based, FRET-based sensors. And we've been able to do that. Again, the sensor was published in, the newly optimized sensor was published in 2018. It measures PK phosphorylation. And during PK phosphorylation, you have instances of high FRET that leads to shorter lifetime, shorter GFP lifetime. We're able to express this sensor in the striatum. One of the questions we were interested in asking is whether or not there are tonic levels of PKA signal in striatal neurons in freely moving animals. So we anesthetized an, um, several animals with 1.5% isoflurane. And what we saw in the delta lifetime over lifetime, we saw an increase in delta lifetime over lifetime measurement. This represents a decrease in PKA phosphorylation. So the, this data set seems to suggest that indeed there are tonic levels of PKA signaling in freely moving animals in striatal neurons. Next, we wanted to look at a behavioral relevant task. So we know that in on Rotorod, there are experience dependent changes that occur on day one of Rotorod training. And we know that this is dependent on region, dorsal lateral, dorsal medial, so it's region selective. And it's also dependent on input, input specificity. And we know that different inputs are engaged based on previous work from our laboratory. So we set up our photometry system and the rotor art system in which the photometry, the rotor art system triggers the start of the photometry system. And what we see on day one, the animals can learn. So this is just our TA car alpha, which are PKA sensor expressed in striatal neurons in the dorsal striatum of C57 male animals. It's not cre-dependent, it's in all neurons. Early on, there's some improvements. So if you look on the far left, and latency to fall on day one, the animals were subjected to 10 trials and there is some learning that occur 
the first three trials, if you time lock the lifetime measurement, there is a small increase in lifetime measurements, which represents a decrease in PK or phosphorylation. If you then look later on in training, on day one, which is we're calling it early, this decrease in PK or phosphorylation seems to go away. If we then look at day five, so we train the animals on for five consecutive days, and from day two to day five, they receive five trials per day. And if we look later on in training, there seems to be no change in PK phosphorylation later on in training. This is really encouraging because this tells us that there are some PK dynamics that occur during different um, time points of learning this task. And that's something we're, we're actively um, looking at and we're exploring and we're continuing. Just to conclude, what I've told you so far is that we now have a second MP single wavelength sensor, so intensity-based sensor, as well as a FET-based sensor that can be used in brain slices and possibly in vivo. We know that our TCSPC, our time-correlated single photon count and fiber photometry system developed by our lab in 2014 can be used to measure lifetime um, measurement in FET-based sensors. We know that there are tonic levels of PK activity in striatal neurons. And we also know that they seem to be a dynamic um, interplay with PK, not interplay, but a dynamic um, PK dynamics that occur during the learning of a skill such as Rotorua. I would like to thank my mentors, my primary mentor, Dr. David Lovinger, as well as my co-mentor, Dr. Stephen Vogel, my colleagues in my laboratory, such as Yolanda, Zhang, and Amando, as well as my students, Alexa and Rashida and everyone else that have contributed to this line of research. Thank you for listening to me. And if you have any questions, please send me an email. I'll be more than happy to answer them. Thank you.